are going. Hello, class. Okay, this is the um, the makeup session uh, to to conclude the course and to finish off uh, freedom of religion and specifically uh, the part of the First Amendment that deals with establishment of religion. Uh, where we left off was in the Simmons versus Zelman Harris case uh, and Chief Justice Rehnquist's first major decision in the, uh, in the freedom of religion area. As I told you, every Chief Justice wants to put, uh, so far, his uh, stamp of approval on each major area of the law. Certainly, First Amendment law is one of those major areas of the law, and you saw that with uh, Chief Justice Warren, Chief Justice Berger, Chief Justice Rehnquist, and uh, this also occurred with Chief Justice Roberts. So this was his first major decision. As is noted in your, in your, uh, in your textbook, Epstein and Walker, uh, Rehnquist pretty much ignored the lemon test. And uh, that is, is fairly typical of establishment uh, jurisprudence with the court either ignoring the lemon test or uh, using it very subjectively since the second prong, prong of the lemon test is whether or not uh, the particular practice um, either inhibits or advances, you know, promotes religion. And that's a very subjective test. So you can use lemon, but then depending upon the, the facts of the specific situation, the majority can, can say, no, well, we don't find that this particularly advances religion or, or, um, or inhibits religion. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a subjective test, at least the second prong. The first prong is uh, that there's a secular purpose that's a pretty, pretty objective, clear test. And the last one also is subjective, which is the entanglement factor. Uh, you can look at a particular practice and you can say, this doesn't require excessive entanglement or this does require excessive entanglement. So with the second and third prongs, there's a lot of room for subjectivity. And I would say that the Establishment Clause jurisprudence, as we found in other areas of the course, has been prone to a lot of sub subjectivity uh, in terms of the decisions. Uh, so, after uh, Zellman versus Simmons-Harris, uh, let's now turn away from uh, the way the Establishment Clause has been uh, interpreted in the context of schools and in particular in primary and secondary schools to uh, how it's been uh, uh, interpreted with respect to other public facilities and, uh, and government funds. First case, and we'll go through these pretty quickly, uh, the first case that we'll discuss is, is Illinois versus McCollum. It's a 1948 Supreme Court decision, and it involved a program of released time for religious instruction. So the public schools were letting students out early so that they can go to uh, religious school. So it might be a, a Catholic school, it might be a Jewish school, it might be any particular religion school. So let's say that the school day was over normally at um, 3 p.m. Uh, students who opted for this program would be released earlier, let's say at 2 p.m., so they could attend religious classes outside uh, of the. Uh, so they could so they could attend religious classes in the public school buildings, but they were separate. Uh, but they were held within the public school buildings. So released time but the religious classes were held in the public schools, and that was declared unconstitutional. Um, as we've seen in other situations, when the governments adapt to the Supreme Court decisions, so New York adopted a 
similar release time program, but in this case, the students were released so they could go to uh, other places, go to their churches or synagogues or other places of worship for religious instruction. And that program, New York's program, was challenged in a case called Zorak, Z-O-R-A-C-H versus Clausen in 1952. It was a release time program for uh, where the instruction occurred outside uh, public schools and that was um, that was upheld. That was found to be constitutional, and so it was that the fact that in the first case, McCullum, the religious instruction took place on school grounds, unconstitutional. Zorak, four years later, the religious instruction under release time occurred in the religious institutions or at least in buildings outside of the of the school that was held to be constitutional and there's a very very famous quote which is often quoted from justice douglas in that which i'll quote for you you could find it at page 160 of your text and um douglas says we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. We guarantee the freedom to worship as one chooses. We make room for a wide, for as wide a variety of beliefs and creeds as the spiritual needs of man deem. When the state encourages religious instruction or cooperates with religious authorities by adjusting the schedule of public events to sectarian needs, it follows the best of our traditions, for it then respects the religious nature of our people and accommodates the public service to their spiritual needs. To hold that it may not be to find callous indifference to religious groups, that would be preferring those who believe in no religion over those who do believe. And so here, Douglas articulates a very, very different uh, viewpoint on neutrality than you see from Stevens in, in many of his uh, in many of his opinions, mostly in concurrence or in dissent. Here, what Douglas is saying, if you didn't, ha- you know, have this type of accommodation, uh, you would not be uh, maintaining neutrality as between religion and lack of religion or irreligion. Um, I I would think in the very same circumstance, uh, Stevens would disagree and he would say um, uh, that neutrality requires uh, uh, not allowing a program like this. Although obviously Stevens wasn't in the court in 1952. So we, that's my my speculation on that. So that was Zorak, 1952. In 1981, there's a case called Widmar, W-I-D-M-A-R versus Vincent. And uh, uh, this involved a uh, a program where uh, religious clubs were meeting, uh, were were barred from meeting in 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 schools, you know there are lots of clubs in uh, in junior high schools and high schools. So there's the you know the orchestra club and the uh, various athletic clubs and all sorts of clubs. But the the rule was that religious clubs could not meet in uh, in the schools, and that that rule was declared unconstitutional as being a violation also of neutrality. Um, and uh, the Congress passed something called the Equal um, uh, Access Act. Um, which required secondary schools to um, accommodate um, religious clubs like that in, um, in their facilities. 
and uh, that was passed in 1984, the Equal Access Act, and uh, that was challenged in 1990 in a case called Board of Ed Education of Westside Community Schools versus Mergens, 1990, and the Equal Access Act was upheld five to four. Obviously, it's a close decision. Um, and uh, so Congress required that if other clubs um, are allowed to meet um, in public schools, in public secondary schools, religious clubs must be allowed to meet there as well. Four judges, ob justices obviously dissented, but that was narrowly upheld in the Mergen's case of 1990. Uh, for three years to the Lambs Chapel case versus Center Mauritius, 1993. Um, and uh, this was uh, a bar on the use of school facilities by religious groups after hours. And uh, the Supreme Court ruled uh, that that was unconstitutional, nine to nothing. Again, um, uh, on the basis of, of that that was hostile to religion. So if you go back to the Lemon Test, uh, one, secular purpose, two, uh, neither um, inhibits, uh, neither shows hostility toward religion nor promotes religion. This, this law was, this, this rule which barred religious clubs from meeting in school facilities after the hours um, was held to be hostile and not neutral. So uh, it, was, it was ruled unconstitutional, nine to nothing. And uh, then we get to a 1995 case, Rosenberger versus uh, the University of Virginia, which involved the uh, denial of student activities funds to um, religious groups, and in particular, in this case, to a Christian group. Um, and again, this is a situation where all sorts of groups and all sorts of uh, activities can get a piece of the student activity funds, but the one set of groups that could not were religious groups, in this particular case, a Christian group, and that rule was struck uh, as being unconstitutional, but, it, but very narrowly, by five to four. Um, so contrast that five to four decision uh, with the nine to zero decision in the case involving facilities. So you see that the issue of the expenditure of funds and the use of funds is far more sensitive and results in a much, much closer uh, decision, five to four, as opposed to nine zip, when simply uh, the issue is the use of the facilities. I think some of this is fairly artificial. Um, obviously, the use of facilities in some way, shape, or form involves funds or money. Uh, facilities have to be maintained, uh, they have to be lit, they have to be heated, etc. So, um, so if you're going to allow a religious group to use a public facility or a school facility uh, after school hours, that is going to involve uh, expenditure of money. Uh, yet the decision there is nine nothing, that they have to be granted access, whereas where you have an explicit uh, use of funds, as in the student activities funds, the decision is five to four. Uh, I point that out just to, to show you, one, that there is this distinction made, but I think, again, the distinction is artificial. It's the same type of artificiality that I see uh, in the discussion of fungibility. Uh, remember last week we talked about um, if if a state law uh, uh, reimbursed a religious school for their religious books, 
um, that would clearly be held unconstitutional. But when school, when uh, states have reimbursed religious schools for the purchase of secular books, you know, chemistry, physics, calculus, etc., that has been ruled constitutional. And the, the question that I asked is, what's the difference? Since money is fungible, and let's say that the school spends roughly the same amount of money on religious texts as it does on, uh, on uh, secular texts, on their chemistry books and their calculus books, what is the difference in giving them $50 for the religious books or $50 for the, uh, the secular books. I don't think there really is much of a distinction. It works out the same way, yet these, these distinctions are honored um, and uh, they result in very different uh, decisions with different alignments of the justices. And again, that's, that's true here with respect to um, the closeness in the Rosenberger case involving a denial of student activities funds, five to four, and the nine to nothing decision, which uh, occurred in Lamb's Chapel versus Center Mariches, which was simply a denial of access to school facilities. In either, in either case, uh, money is, public money is going to be expended uh, in support of uh, of a, a religious activity. All right. Um, uh, now let's turn to um, to another type of subject, and there is a series of cases involving uh, 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 subject matter teaching in in public schools. You probably have all heard about the the famous Scopes trial, which occurred in the nineteen. 19- uh, 1920s in the United States involving uh, William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow and uh, the teaching of, of evolution and uh, there's been a there was a f- famous book written about it called Inherit the Wind and there was a famous movie done uh, about it as well which some of you may have have seen uh, but that um, you know, that debate has persisted, and I think probably that debate is still ongoing, and some part of what's going on tomorrow uh, in Alabama in the, the senatorial election, because uh, Roy Moore is a, uh, is a fundamentalist, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that, um, although I'm, you know, I'm speculating here, I'm fairly sure that he has advocated uh, that only uh, uh, creation science should be taught in public schools or it should be taught equally and that uh, evolution uh, is against, you know, against the Bible and against the Word of God. Well, anyway, there have been cases uh, on that very subject. The first that one that we'll look at is Epperson, E-P-P-E-R-S-O-N versus Arkansas. It's a 1968 decision, and it was a nine to nothing decision, a unanimous uh, decision of the Supreme Court ruling um, unconstitutional an Arkansas law which banned uh, the teaching of evolution on the basis that it was sacrilegious. Uh, So that was a pretty much of a slam dunk nine zip Supreme Court says you cannot ban the teaching of evolution because the basis of that is a you know is the advocacy of a of a religious uh, belief in the way that creation occurred. So that was ruled unconstitutional, nine to nothing. Um, states like Arkansas and uh, in this particular case, Louisiana, were not deterred. So. Um, they wanted to, they went back at that. And um, these things have taken various forms. In some cases, uh, an outright ban on teaching uh, evolutionary theory. In other cases, requiring um, equal treatment 
for uh, thinly disguised uh, sort of biblical uh, teaching. And uh, as many of you know, there is um, there are a couple of of sort of scientific names that have been attached to sort of putting a scientific patina or gloss over biblical teaching about creation. In some instances, it's referred to as creation science. In other instances, it's referred to as uh, the theory of intelligent design. But uh, essentially what you have with creation science and intelligent design is um, biblical teaching about, uh, about uh, creation, which is then uh, both linguistically and uh, in other ways sort of covered with a, a little veneer of, of, uh, of science. And again, uh, uh, that's true of creation science and it's also true of intelligent design. My son, who is a writer, wrote a very, very good article about, about intelligence, intelligent design, which uh, was published in uh, the Weekly Standard a number of years ago. Um, and um, uh, there's a case in 1987 called Edwards versus Aguillard. It involves a Louisiana law. Edwards was the governor of, of Louisiana. And the Louisiana law said, if you teach evolution, you must also teach creation science. So it's sort of an equal time provision. So if you teach this, um, if you teach evolution in your schools, you must teach creation science. Now, there was no requirement under a Louisiana law, law, God love them, that you teach anything in particular. You could simply ignore um, how uh, we got to where we are now. So you didn't have to teach evolution. You didn't have to teach creation science. And indeed, you didn't have to teach anything about how, um, how we came to be, how the species came to be, uh, where it is, uh, both the human species and all other species. So you could just basically have a uh, public school curriculum that just didn't deal with that at all. The only thing that the law said is, if you teach evolution, you must also teach, uh, quote, creation science. And that law was declared unconstitutional, but this time in a 7-2 to two decision, and we'll talk about what the two said in a minute. But the, uh, the majority, the seven uh, justice majority said, um, they said this is clearly not neutral. Uh, and they, although there was probably in the law a statement of some kind of our attempt at neutrality, they looked to the legislative history of the law and the statements of the supporters of the law and the way that the law works and they concluded that the goal of the law was clearly to counter uh, evolutionary theory and to the teaching of evolutionary theory because it detracted from the legislature's religious beliefs. Uh, and they said that the stated justification of, of, quote, academic freedom and neutrality is a, quote, uh, sham. Uh, I'll read you a quote from on the bottom of page 165. Um, if the Louisiana legislature's purpose was solely to maximize the comprehensiveness and effectiveness of science instruction, it would have encouraged the teaching of all scientific theories about the origins of humankind. But under the act's requirements, Teachers who were once free to teach any and all facets of this subject are now unable to do so. Moreover, the act fails even to ensure that creation science will be taught, but instead requires the teaching of this theory only when the theory of evolution is taught. Thus, we agree with the Court of Appeals' conclusion that the act does not serve to protect academic freedom, but 
has the distinctly different purpose of discrediting evolution by counterbalancing its teaching at every turn with the teaching of creationism. And so that sort of summarizes um, what the court did there. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a dissent from two justices written by uh, Justice Scalia. He said, uh, and I, you know, this is strange to me, but he says you should disregard uh, the, uh, the statements uh, in the legislative history um, you know, of the act sponsor. The, act, the, the sponsor clearly said that this was to counter uh, evolutionary theory and to advance, uh, you know, um, um, sort of a scientifically covered uh, uh, religious teaching or biblical teaching. And what Scalia says, you should disregard the statements of the sponsor and instead just look to the wording of the statute and look to the, uh, uh, the legislative findings. And it's sort of like, uh, hide your eyes on this. And I, I find this to be a very, very strange dissent because the, the looking into the legislative history is the kind of thing that uh, courts always do, justices always do. Um, last year in my civil liberties course, we uh, studied uh, the Heller decision, which is Justice Scalia's very, very major Second Amendment uh, uh, decision. And uh, he goes probably 30 pages into legislative history and contemporaneous legislative history and statements of various legislators and, and usage like that. So to say in this context, to disregard uh, what the clear intention was as expressed by the bill's sponsor is very strange to me. But in any event, he says it, it's a dissent, uh, but the, the ruling of the court is that this Louisiana law that required uh, that again didn't require any teaching of anything but if you taught evolution you must also give equal time and teach creation science that was held to be unconstitutional in a seven to two decision um, and I think you can uh, you can start to see um, sort of a, a pretty clear pattern in the cases um, the court is much much stricter when it deals with schools, especially uh, primary and secondary schools. Um, they're, they're very tough uh, with respect to um, uh, teaching, with respect to religious activities, etc. Uh, within the context of, of uh, primary and secondary schools. Much, much less concerned uh, when uh, the activity occurs outside of schools. Um, and again, that goes back to something we discussed last week, which is uh, the school uh, context is, con is, is considered to be um, implicitly coercive. Uh, coercive and also that students are considered to be impressionable. So that uh, uh, a certain activity like prayer, like Bible reading, whatever it is, is much, much, it plays very differently in a school setting where kids have to go to school, right, and are uh, very impressionable, uh, subject to pressure from their peers, subject to pressure from their teachers and administrators, very, very different uh, if it occurs outside of school. And you see that in this decision. Um, in 1985, there's a case called um, Wallace versus Jaffrey. And uh, again, it occurs in the context of schools uh, in Alabama, where there was a mandated daily period of silence. And uh, that was ruled to be um, you know, and it was a daily, daily period of silence for meditation 
or voluntary prayer. And you could see that in drafting that, they had in mind an attempt, uh, at least, um, at neutrality. Now, one might, you know, infer, especially from recent events uh, in Alabama and the history of Alabama, that this really was supposed to be, you know, a, a period of silence for, for, for prayer. But it just says for meditation or voluntary prayer. Um, yet that was declared unconstitutional uh, as if in the same way as if uh, it was um, you know a period of, of silence for prayer or uh, not even a period of silence for prayer but actual prayers being stated um, and despite the uh, the attempt at neutrality or, or the patina of neutrality, uh, the Supreme Court rules uh, that that's unconstitutional. And again, I think that probably is based upon the legislative history, um, and the legislative history probably uh, showed that uh, the purpose of this was to advance religious interests and, and to advance prayer or to leave uh, to have a mandatory period uh, of likely prayer in the in the public schools, and that's in 1985. Uh, uh, Scalia doesn't come into the court until October of 1986, and you see in this decision that we just reviewed before, Scalia um, saying, "Hey, let's not look at the uh, let's not look at that legislative history," but clearly. In 1985, they were looking at the legislative history, as they were also um, in the subsequent case where Scalia was just in the minority. Uh, in 1992, there's a case called Lee, L-E-E -E versus Weissman, um, and it's involved a prayer at a graduation of a public school. Again, the prayer at the graduation was held unconstitutional. Um, and in 2000, in a case called Santa Fe versus Doe, uh, public school prayer at a football game, unconstitutional. So um, you can see how very, 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 very strict uh, and vigilant the court is with respect to prayer or religious activities in public school context. And when I say public school, I'm talking about primary or secondary uh, schools. You, can, you know, as we've discussed before, that they are less strict when we get to the uh, college level because, uh, for one thing, college is not mandatory as, as primary and some secondary school is, at least up to usually age 16. And uh, college students like yourselves are deemed to be much less subject to coercion and much less impressionable, subject to peer pressure, subject to pressure from people like me, etc. So uh, it plays very different. So always remember when you're thinking about these issues with respect to any new um, uh, law which someone would challenge as a, uh, an establishment of religion, it's going to be uh, scrutinized much, much more strictly if it occurs um, in the context of primary or secondary school because of this coercion uh, factor which uh, has played such a big role. Just so. No, no Bible reading in public schools. No New York State, uh, you know, Regents Prayer, Engel versus Vitali in public schools. No, um, no, you know, mandatory silent period in public schools. No prayer at the graduation of a primary or secondary school. No prayer at a football game of a public high school. Uh, very, very, very strict. Um, um, so now let's go outside of the school and let's see how, how it plays differently in uh, a non-school context. 
big case uh, a few years ago was Town of Greece versus Galloway that comes out of the the New York town of Greece which is right near Rochester New York um, and um, uh, Town of Greece began their uh, their public meetings, their regular public meetings, with a uh, with prayer, and they invited in uh, uh, ministers from the local community to lead uh, uh, the you know both the assembled um, uh, town officials and anybody attending the meeting. And it's important to understand that this is. Not exactly like a meeting of the New York State Legislature, or not exactly like a meeting of Congress. This was a, it was a legislative body, but it was also the type of you know town legislative body that had um, that heard petitions from citizens at these meetings and made decisions about you know what they were asking for. I just recently attended. A meeting in my town like this. My town upstate is the town of Austerlitz, New York, in Columbia County, and I went before them and I asked the town supervisors to pave the road where my house is. We have a uh, we have a very very badly maintained uh, gravelly dirt road, which is. Uh, uh, a safety hazard. It's been that way for as long as I've lived there, 30 years. And so I went and made a little speech and explained why uh, it would be much safer for the people who lived on my road for it to be paved. And it also that ultimately would save the, the town a lot of money since they, the, uh, the expense of maintaining this dirt gravel road and plowing it and throwing uh, crushed rock on it three or four times a year far outweighed in terms of cost the price of just paving it correctly once and then the minimal maintenance that occurs so I I'm sympathetic to the the differences in these types of town boards and town meetings than than uh, a state legislature or the Congress so this was that that type of a of a town board uh, in Greece, New York, and they always began their town meetings with um, with prayer led by a local priest or minister. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court, in a very, very bitterly divided decision, uh, upheld uh, this um, this this uh, this practice in the town of Greece by a five to four decision. Um, um, now, some of the facts in this case were that uh, for nine years prior to this uh, practice being challenged uh, by somebody in the town, um, all of the, uh, the prayer sessions that began at the beginning of the meeting uh, were led by Christian ministers, either Catholic priests or various Protestant ministers. Um, uh, they in those nine years they had never invited any anybody other than a Catholic or Protestant priest or minister. Uh, the the uh, clergy were drawn from a guide, a local guide that listed only Christian churches, despite the fact that there were other. Uh, uh, other religious institutions within the town of Greece, such as a Buddhist temple. There were also 3,000 Jews who lived in the town, although they worshipped in a um, in a synagogue was, which was just outside of the town. Um, um, uh, unlike Engel, the town didn't write the prayers. You know, the, these were whatever the particular priest or minister wanted to say. Um, I'll read you from uh, the court's opinion, which is found on page 173 and um, 174 of your, of your text. Um, the, the court says, In rejecting the suggestion that legislative prayer must be non-sectarian, the court does not imply that no constraints remain on its content 
the relevant, the relevant constraint derives from its place at the opening of legislative sessions where it is meant to lend gravity to the occasion and f reflect values long part of the nation's heritage. Prayer that is solemn and respectful in tone that invites lawmakers to reflect upon shared ideals and common ends before they embark on the fractious business of governing serves that legitimate function. If the course and practice over time shows that the invocations denigrate non-believers or religious minorities, threaten damnation or preach conversion, many present may consider the prayer to fall short of the desire to elevate the purpose of the occasion and to unite lawmakers in their common effort. That circumstance would present a different case than the one presently before the court. So what the court is saying, what the majority of the court is saying is, look, this is just, this is really not directed at the uh, citizens who attend these meetings. It's really di directed at the lawmakers and the public officials themselves. It's meant to put them in the proper spirit to do their important work, their public business, and that's all that's going on here. If it was used to in any way coerce or um, intimidate uh, non-believers or believers of different faiths, that would be a very different case. Now, um, uh, I'll point out, and this is also pointed out in the dissent, and as you, as, as those of you who read my, <laughs> the article I wrote about this uh, for the Times Union, um, uh, the facts <laughs> are very different than the way the majority characterized situations. Uh, the board members, while the prayer was going on, they crossed themselves. Um, the uh, the dissents pointed out that uh, you know that again. Uh, nobody other than a Christian uh, priest or minister had been invited. Uh, that um, that uh, that um, people from other religions or non-believers were subjected to this this prayer. Quote: At the very moment that they were petitioning their elected leaders, like me, you know, for um, to pave my road. So let's say. You know, this is me, and um, you know, I'm either a non-believer or I'm a believer in some other um, uh, faith. And uh, you know, a priest comes in, and he crosses himself, and uh, the members of the board cross themselves. And let's say I, you know, I'm I don't want to watch that, so I get up and I walk out. And it's a little town meeting. Everybody sees me walk out. Then I walk back in and uh, say, hey, spend $250,000 and pave my road. Well, I might, you know, think about not walking out, you know, uh, and, and because I might feel that I might offend uh, these uh, town officials who've just crossed themselves by walking out. So I think there is a, uh, and the dissent says this, that this is, uh, again, at the very moment of petitioning their elected leaders. And uh, they said that Greece violated the lemon test, uh, which leads to political division along religious lines. And they say this, that was one of the principal evils against which the First Amendment was intended to protect. Um, and um, by the way, I'll point out that in this case, um, as I told you, in uh, for the first nine years before it was uh, it was uh, challenged, they only um, invited just Christian uh, 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 ministers or priests. Afterwards, after there was a protest, and while this case was working its way through the courts, they, um, they, they invited other um, religious figures. They had a Wiccan uh, priestess also. I think they also 
invited a, uh, a Jewish uh, rabbi to come, etc. Uh, but at one of the meetings, when uh, a Christian minister was addressing uh, the, uh, the meeting and, and uh, either before or after saying uh, the prayer, he attacked the people who had, who had uh, filed the lawsuit as, quote, a minority who are ignorant of the history of our country. So here's a, uh, uh, a priest or a minister attacking people who have invoked the First Amendment to protect their own uh, religious liberty, and they are attacked by the priest as a minority who are ignorant of the history of our country. All of this is pointed out in the, uh, in the very, very strong um, four-person dissent. So that's town of, uh, Gal uh, town of Greece versus Galloway. Uh, there have been a number of cases involving religious displays on public grounds. Uh, they're very fact-specific, uh, and I'm generalizing here, but symbols such as Christmas trees and menorahs have generally been a rule to be okay and not uh, violating uh, the principle of a religious establishment, uh, and in other cases, creches have generally been, you know, nativity scenes have generally been ruled not permissible uh, when um, when established with public funds, etc. So, uh, again, I, I find some of this distinction a bit artificial. Uh, but again, most of the cases involving Christmas tree is okay, menorah is okay. And you see, by the way, in, uh, in Manhattan, there's a, there are obviously large public Christmas trees, and there's also a huge menorah in, in Central Park. Um, now, one of the things you've heard about Roy Moore is uh, he violated a particular court ruling about the display of the Ten Commandments. There have been lots of Ten Commandments cases, and um, um, generally speaking, the in the Ten Commandments cases, uh, uh, the Ten Commandments have not been uh, permitted to be uh, displayed uh, or represented in schools, but generally okay uh, in other public places. Um, I find. The Ten Commandments cases to be, uh, you know, pretty interesting, um, because, uh, you know, and and the and the and the cases that say, uh, and the and the most probably the most famous case is a case involving a display of the Ten Commandments in the at the state capitol uh, in in Austin, Texas, uh, in a uh, an area where they have some. A uh, number of various representations of things important to the people of Texas and important to the history of Texas, and one of those things is is a big um, a big sculpture which includes the Ten Commandments. And in the in the in the case which upholds the ability of Texas to display the Ten Commandments, they they point out that the Ten Commandments. Uh, are both secular and uh, and uh, they also have religious significance because um, much of our law, you know, much of uh, of uh, of American law is to some extent based upon the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments say you can't steal, and and obviously there are uh, state, federal, and local lo laws that say you can't steal. And there are uh, the Ten Commandments says you say you can't kill, and uh, there are analogous uh, laws at every level. The Ten Commandments say you can't bear false witness, lie, you know, swear under oath, etc. And there are also, you know, state, federal, and local laws which prohibit that. So they stress that that to some extent the Ten Commandments are embody secular principles. Um, I, I really don't buy that. I mean, the Ten Commandments, um, you know, start out 
with uh, the first commandment, which is, uh, you know, I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, and that is clearly a, uh, a, a Judeo-Christian principle of, of, of not only monotheism, which would be um, antagonistic to any follower of a polytheistic religion, but it's clearly a statement that it's our God, you know. Our God is the one God. And it's clearly a Judeo-Christian principle. And that's the first, that's the first commandment, sort of like the First Amendment. And we know from our study of the First Amendment that it is, it is the uber-preferred freedom. And in the same way, the First Commandment is the uber preferred first commandment and to make that point in the Texas display of the Ten Commandments the first commandment is written in bigger letters and uh, it is made more prominent in a variety of ways so the the courts have generally upheld the display of the Ten Commandments in public places as not constituting an impermissible uh, establishment of religion they have held uh, contrary to that or, or in a different way that it's not, uh, uh, you cannot display it that way in public schools. And the, the distinction between public schools and, uh, and especially uh, primary and secondary schools is the same thing. The, the, uh, the required attendance in public schools and the course of nature of primary and secondary school and the impressionability of students in primary and secondary public schools. So that's why that distinction is made. And the last case that we're going to talk about is, um, is a case called Hosanna Tabor versus the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. It's a 2012 decision. And um, it's a good case to end uh, the discussion on because it um, it is a case which was which raised both both parts of the First Amendment freedom of religion, both uh, the free exercise of religion and the prohibition on the establishment of religion. And the facts of the case are that um, there was a there's a woman who was a teacher um, in a specific um, Lutheran school. And uh, she was a so-called called uh, teacher. The, this Lutheran school, and this was the Missouri Synod of the Lutheran Church, had two, two types of teachers that taught in their schools. They had lay teachers, and then they had so-called called teachers. And the called teachers were uh, teachers that were called to their profession by God and by the congregation. And to become a called teacher, uh, you had to uh, go through a rigorous six-year uh, educational plan, and then you were called. Or, and and it, wasn't, it wasn't automatic. It wasn't simply, it wasn't like you, uh, you finish your six years and then you're called. But to be called, at the very least, you had to uh, to complete this very, very rigorous six-year program, and then you could potentially be called by the congregation, acting um, motivated by God to to your calling as a as a called teacher in the Missouri Synod Lutheran uh, Church schools, and this involved one of those one of those teachers who was a called teacher. By the way. When you are called teacher in these schools, you are deemed to be a minister. You sometimes lead services. You teach religious subjects as well as secular subjects. Uh, and you do a number of things which are clearly um, religious in nature, religious instruction, leading religious services, in, uh, and the indoctrination of uh, religious principles. Uh, to both uh, students and to the congregation. So you are 
um, called a minister, you're deemed to be a minister, and I would say the facts support uh, the assertion that this type of called teacher is a type of minister of the uh, Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. So this involves one of these called teacher slash ministers. Uh, she was teaching. Uh, she got very, very, after teaching a number of years, uh, she got very sick with uh, narcolepsy. Uh, she uh, got better and she was certified as being uh, okay and healthy enough to return to teaching by her doctors. She went, said, she went back to the church and she said, I want my job back. And they said, no, we, we don't think you're uh, up to it. Um, we're not going to take you back as a cold slash uh, as a called teacher slash minister, but we will help you. We'll help you pay for your uh, your insurance, uh, etc. And she said that this was a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. She went to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EOC. They agreed with her that this not taking her back as a teacher, uh, violated the Americans with Disabilities Act. And um, so she and they, the EOC and this teacher, uh, sued. Uh, they sued the church. And uh, as soon as they sued the church, uh, they then, uh, you know, they withdrew their offer of assistance and they claimed that uh, it would be a violation of the First Amendment to uh, it would be a violation of the First Amendment to force them to take this woman back as a teacher slash minister. And by the way, one of the reasons they they um, they uh, at that point, you know, at first at first they simply refused to take her back. Uh, on full status, uh, but, uh, but it offered to help her. After she sued, after she went to the EEOC and sued them, they fired her. You know, they absolutely terminated their relationship with her. And they said that uh, by going to court against them, they, that she had violated a religious principle, which was to, to settle disputes, uh, not uh, going to court, not uh, invoking um, legal remedies, and that this was a violation of their religious principles. Um, and the Supreme Court sided with the with the church. They said that this came within the uh, the minister exception, which basically says that um, it is a violation of both uh, establishment of religion that part of the First Amendment and of the free exercise clause, the free exercise of religion. It violates both to, uh, to require the church to take her back. Uh, the minister's exception says, in terms of establishment of religion, that uh, to require her, the, the church to take this woman back would essentially be allowing the government to choose ministers for this church. And they said it is a violation of the, uh, the no establishment clause to, to, for the state to de facto um, choose the ministers or any minister of a church. And it violates that part of the, uh, of the freedom of religion. They also said to in any way interfere with the church's decision of who their ministers will should be or who their ministers should not be and who they should hire as ministers and who they might fire and disqualify as a minister would violate uh, the church's and the church members' right of the free exercise of their religion. So on both scores, um, uh, they found that this, uh, they sided with the church, 
and said that this fell within the ministerial exception. And I guess it's an exception to what? It's an exception to the uh, to sort of the the spirit of the lemon test. Um, that if you went if you ran this this decision by the church, uh, you know, through the lemon test, it might violate it. But this is an exception to that. Um, that that once we're dealing with the the ministry, you know, this could be. Um, you know, minister of a Christian church, the rabbi of a, of a, uh, of, of, in the Jewish faith, an imam in the Muslim faith, uh, Wiccan priestess, whatever it is, you know, um, that, you know, you cannot tell them who their, their uh, clergy should be, and you uh, can't mess in any way, shape, or form with their decision of who that should be and who that should not be that uh, and to do so would violate both uh, establishment of religion and also would interfere with the free exercise of religion and uh, on the facts of this case I, I, I heartily agree with uh, with this decision I think it's a uh, it's it's correctly decided um, uh, this was written by Justice Roberts, by Chief Justice Roberts, and this decision, as I said, with, uh, with Lemon, with uh, Chief Justice Berger, and uh, with uh, Simmons versus Zellman Harris, with uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, and uh, I can't recall exactly which one, but I, I told you about the first major decision uh, freedom of religion decision or establishment decision that was written by Chief Justice Warren. This was Chief Justice Roberts' first shot, and I think he wrote a very, very strong opinion here, and I agree with it. Um, it was a unanimous uh, decision um, with a nine to nothing ruling. However, um, there were a couple of concurring opinions, and one of the concurring opinions said this should not be a narrow exception with respect to ministers, you know, um, you know, uh, meaning, you know, priest, minister, rabbi, imam, not, you know, not just the head honcho. Um, it should, uh, it, 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 there should be no interference whatsoever with, um, with when religions deal with the people um, with their employees, not, not all employees, not somebody who's a cook in the kitchen, right? Uh, but their employees who are involved, as this teacher was, in uh, the practice of the religion. So again, this teacher, this called teacher, who was deemed to be a minister, was involved in teaching the religion to the students in sometimes leading services, in teaching the religion to non-students who were members of the church. So in a variety of ways, she was involved in religious practices. And what the concurrence says is that this should extend beyond ministers and priests and rabbis and imams to anybody in a religious faith or order who is involved in administering the religion, not just the head man or woman. So I guess in, in the Jewish religion, this would also be the cantor. And, um, and uh, in the Catholic religion, various uh, sisters, you know, nuns, monks, uh, abbots, etc., etc. So it should be, the concurrence said, we have no business and it is a violation of both free exercise and a violation of, uh, of, uh, of the no establishment clause to in any way, shape, or form uh, interfere with the way that a religious uh, faith or order deals with its employees who are involved with the practice of that religion, the teaching of that religion, the uh, the the uh, 
the observance of that religion. If they're, you know, if they're working in the kitchen or fixing the, or maintaining the uh, facilities, etc., then they're not exempt from, uh, you know, generally applicable employment laws. But when it comes to those other, those kinds of religious exercise employees, there should be a, a complete, um, you know, wall of separation. So that's, uh, that's the, the last case that we're going to deal with. Um, uh, sort of in conclusion on this part, um, you, we've, we've, we've looked at the, you know, we've looked at the two uh, parts of, of, of uh, freedom of religion under the First Amendment. We've looked at the free exercise clause and we've looked at establishment of religion. And I think you've, you've noticed that there's a kind of tension between those two in certain cases, certainly not in this last case that, where they both go in the same direction. Um, I don't know that that tension is absolutely necessary. I think that tension has been created to some extent by the different way that the court has dealt with situations involving claims of violation of free exercise on the one hand and uh, on the other hand claims of violation of the uh, no establishment of religion clause. Um, so I think the tension really comes more in the, uh, in the interpretation that the court has given than uh, it was intended by the framers of the Constitution. I think they saw um, these things working uh, in unison, working together uh, to advance uh, the, same, the same goals. One, to protect government from uh, from the distortions and corruptions that religion, that injecting religion into the public sphere, would uh, would result in, and again, all uh, based upon uh, what had happened every place else in the world before the establishment of of the United States. Uh, so they were trying to protect against the way religion uh, hurts and distorts government and they were trying to protect religion from distortion by interference from government. And uh, the way they felt that that could be best achieved was by both the free exercise clause and the no establishment clause. So I don't think that the framers of the Constitution saw any tension between uh, these, these two provisions of, of freedom of religion. There is, there has been some tension, but I think that has come about by um, the way that the court has on the one hand interpreted the free exercise clause, and on the other hand the way that the court has sometimes interpreted uh, the no establishment clause. Um, and that, I think, has created the tension. So. For example, let's go back to the Smith case, the case involving uh, the Native Americans who ingested peyote, uh, who were then uh, fired from their jobs as drug counselors, who applied uh, for unemployment compensation and were turned down. Um, and in, I think, a, a, a brilliant decision by Justice Scalia, he says, uh, you know, he says, look, um, to exempt uh, these Native Americans from uh, these otherwise generally applicable laws that apply to everybody else with respect to uh, this controlled substance, the peyote, etc., would be allow each you know, uh, follower of a particular religion to become a law unto themselves. And that's not, you know, that's not what the First Amendment it was intended to do. Um, but in the, um, and that's, that, and that was Justice Scalia, okay, but then when you turn around, and that's a free exercise case, because uh, the Native Americans challenged that, that Oregon law, and the application of that Oregon law as a violation of their right to free exercise, to, to use peyote in their, uh, in their sacramental practice. And 
we have the the Smith decision, which rejects that. But then on the on the establishment front, you have the court uh, the court often and frequently accommodating, um, you know, the in religious practice in in the public sphere and um, taking a very very different approach and that it in a, and that does have tension with with the way that the court has interpreted the free exercise clause but that that's a result of what the court has done as opposed to what I think um, what was intended by the by the framers of the Constitution which again was to protect religion from the corruption of government, from the corrupting influence of government, and co uh, protect government from the corrupting and distorting influence of religion. Um, so anyway, that brings us full circle. Um, I do want to say uh, uh, something about the masterpiece cake shop uh, oral argument, which I attended, and I told you I would tell you something about. Um, Obviously, we don't have a decision yet. It was only argued, uh, uh, you know, six days ago. Um, it was a, uh, it was a really uh, fascinating argument. Um, uh, everybody is making predictions, uh, I'll, and so I'll make my prediction. And then just go back to the facts, which we know. Uh, the uh, two guys. Uh, this in 2012, uh, they were about to go to Massachusetts to get married. Uh, they could not get married in Colorado at the time because at the time this was before Obergefell and uh, Colorado did not provide with these two guys with the opportunity to enter into a, uh, a same-sex marriage. Uh, and uh, so anyway, they were about to go to, to Massachusetts where they could be married. They went into the Masterpiece Cake Shop, which was famous for doing uh, commissioned cakes for special occasions. Uh, according to the record, they walked in with all sorts of plans for what they wanted on their cake. As soon as they uh, told the owner and he understood that, that what, he, what they wanted was a um, a, um, a commission cake, a, a specifically designed cake to celebrate their same-sex wedding. He told them uh, he wouldn't do that. It was against his religious principles. Uh, his religious principles were, you know, were opposed to same-sex marriage. Um, he says he told them um, they could have anything else in the store, any, any other cakes, any uh, already made cakes, any brownies, anything else he sold, they um, they left, and there was some disagreement as exactly as to exactly what happened in the store, the way that the uh, the the baker characterized uh, what happened is very different than the way uh, that the uh, uh, the two guys uh, characterized. So there's there is some uh, dispute as to you know. Who said exactly what? But there's no dispute that they could not get the cake that they wanted to celebrate their same-sex marriage. They, by the way, they ultimately went to Massachusetts and were married. Um, and uh, and uh, at the Supreme Court level, uh, the uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop and the Master Baker there, supported by the United States now as Amicus Curiae. Uh, took the position that to force this guy to bake uh, this cake to celebrate this same-sex marriage would, one, uh, violate um, the part of the First Amendment which deals with the free exercise of religion, um, and two, would also violate um, uh, the, uh, the baker's freedom of speech because uh, forcing him to make a cake uh, to celebrate this event with uh, presumably with symbols and or words which celebrated uh, same-sex wedding um, and that could be you know as innocuous as you know uh, congratulations uh, uh, with the two guys names or it could be 
um, much more detailed with more detailed images and more detailed words. But um, to force him to do that would be to force him to speak. And they argued from uh, the Hurley case, which we, we studied, which was the case where the, uh, the St. Patrick's Day parade was not required to permit a, uh, um, uh, an LGBTQ group to, uh, to march in the parade. Uh, the Supreme Court held that would be forcing the parade uh, to speak and would violate their First Amendment rights. So the baker here um, and the United States as amicus curiae took the position that this would be forced speech in violation of the freedom of speech and it would be a violation of the baker's uh, right to the free exercise of his religion. Um, and uh, uh, the state of Colorado and these two guys on the other side uh, obviously argued to the contrary that it it didn't implicate uh, or did not violate either provision of uh, the First Amendment, either speech uh, nor free exercise of religion. Um, it looked from the oral argument that it, it was going to be another five to four decision, and it looked to many people that um, uh, Kennedy once again would be the swing voter. Um, I I think, as you know, don't like uh, Justice Kennedy very much. I think um, I tend to agree to some extent with um, with Justice Scalia that he is, uh, you know, he's very pedantic and he throws around a lot of, uh, you know, uh, big and flowery words, and that uh, not a lot of that is always rooted in in the law or the Constitution. I also dislike him, and I think uh, some of the other justices dislike him because he's very, very much aware of his power as the swing voter, and he, to some extent, flaunts that and sort of invites the parties to argue to him. It's almost, he obviously doesn't say this explicitly, but it's almost implicit that he, you, you sort of see him with his body language and the way he asks his questions and the way he sometimes interrupts, which is, hey, guys, we all know that it doesn't really matter what these four people on this side think, and we don't really, it really doesn't matter what these four people on the other side think. It really matters what I think, because I'm going to be the determinative vote in this case, as he has been in so many cases. And I think um, his attitude in that regard was exemplified at this, this argument. And I think he, he, he really flaunts it, and I think he really revels in it. And so he spent the first half of the argument, and they went on for an hour and 20 minutes, which is 20 minutes longer than they had been allocated, but the court allowed uh, a, uh, 80 minutes of argument rather than 60 minutes of argument. They didn't permit that uh, in advance, but they simply allowed each and every one of the four advocates to go on for around five minutes over their allocated time. So it, it was 80 minutes of argument, which is a very long argument. And Kennedy spent around the first 40 minutes um, sort of attacking the position of the United States and the Baker uh, when it came to the arguments about free speech. So if this was purely a free speech decision, and if it's the case, that Kennedy is the deciding vote, it would be five to four in support of Colorado and in support of the, uh, the two guys. Uh, but then when the argument in the second half, the last 40 minutes shifted to freedom of religion, uh, Kennedy was attacking, pretty much attacking Colorado and the attorney for the guys. Um, and if this was exclusively a freedom of religion case, and if it's, if it's the case that Kennedy is the deciding vote, then uh, you would think it's going to be five to four in support of, of the Baker and the United States. Um, let me hasten to add that this is the United States now, right? If this case had been argued during the Obama administration, the United States 
would be on the other side. And if Hillary Clinton had won the election and had appointed someone other than Neil Gorsuch, like uh, Merrick Garland or Sri Srinivasan or anybody that Clinton would have appointed, the United States would be arguing on the other side of the case. So this was a very, very, very graphic uh, demonstration of the principle that you've heard ad nauseum this year that elections have consequences. Well, um, it appears that it'll have a consequence in this case. It appears that Kennedy is the deciding vote, and it's not clear which way he's going. Again, uh, on, the f on the free speech side, he seemed to be going for the uh, for the state of Colorado and the men, uh, the married men. And when we got to freedom of religion, it appeared that he was uh, siding with uh, the United States and with the Baker. So, uh, and he, again, he likes, he likes that. He likes keeping everybody focused on him and what he will do. I... I'm going to go really out on the limb here, and I have... Um, I have uh, a sort of a contrarian uh, point of view about what may happen in this case. I guess if, if, you, if, if I had my last you know, $10 and I was forced to bet it, I would say it's gonna be five to four and Kennedy is gonna be the deciding vote without saying which way it's gonna go. Um, but uh, since I don't have to bet my last 10 bucks, I'm gonna take a slightly contrarian view here. And that is, uh, uh, I think I was reading, I, I felt like I was reading Roberts as not particularly liking uh, the government's position, the government meaning the United States and the Baker's position in this case, and that it might result in a decision for Colorado and for uh, the married men, five to four with Roberts, uh, the deciding vote, or maybe potentially even six to three if, uh, if Kennedy goes that way. Uh, and again, I can't, I can't um, give you a lot of good reasons for that, but there was just something, and that's one of the reasons you go to oral argument and you see it, and I guess I was reading some real discomfort uh, from Roberts uh, with uh, the, the position taken by the, the Baker and by the United States as amicus curiae. So maybe that's just uh, me being hopeful. I do like Roberts. I generally disagree with his decisions, but I do like him. I do think he sees his, his role as Chief Justice being very important. I think he sometimes decides against his own sort of predilections as he did in the two Obamacare decisions and uh, I do respect him so I have I'm holding out some slight hope that he goes in the other direction there uh, the other thing is that as we discussed in class this was a bad set of facts to make a major decision because in 2012 these guys could not get married in Colorado and indeed if and when and they did get married in Massachusetts in 2012 Colorado would not have granted full faith and credit to that marriage and would not have treated them as being married even though they got married lawfully in Massachusetts because neither of those things happened in Colorado by 2012, and I don't believe they happened until after uh, the decision of Obergefell, which both required every state to provide the opportunity for same-sex couples to get a full, valid marriage, and also required um, every state in the country to grant uh, full faith and credit to a marriage performed in, um, in other states. So, um, but because that wasn't so in Colorado in 2012, this is a really funny and I think bad set of facts for the Supreme Court to make what is gonna be a really major decision. And why is it a major decision? 
Um, it's a major decision because of its far-reaching implications. As uh, Justice Breyer, Justice Kagan, Justice uh, uh, Sotomayor, and, uh, uh, and Justice Ginsburg pointed out constantly, they kept on saying, well, what's the difference between a baker and a chef and a tailor and a makeup artist and a photographer? And they tried to show the uh, far-reaching implications. At some point, Justice Breyer very, very uh, wisely said, uh, we're trying to find some line here which would not allow a uh, decision in this case to blow a huge hole in public accommodations law. Public accommodations law meaning the law that says if you operate, you know, a restaurant or a bakery or a lunch counter or a barbershop or anything like that, right? Um, if you're open for business, you have to take everybody and you can't discriminate on the basis of race or sex or um, national origin or religion or, and increasingly now on the basis of sexual orientation. And, um, you know, we don't want, you know, in a decision here to say, okay, then the next case is, um, you know, it's against my religion to sell a cake to somebody in a uh, interracial marriage or in, uh, you know, uh, or of a, of a religion that I, uh, another religion which I, uh, uh, which my religion tells me, uh, you know, is not a valid religion, etc. And that led to two kinds of answers coming from the various advocates. Uh, the United States and the and the Baker's attorney said, race is different, race is special, you know, and there and they cited cases where the same kind of arguments had been made by uh, store owners that didn't want to serve. Um, uh, African Americans in the 1960s and the court said you can't do that you know you would violate the public accommodations and of uh, and 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 race is treated differently okay um, even among various things that are forbidden in the civil rights laws race is just treated differently it's treated differently because it has a sort of a higher constitutional status because of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, and in particular the 14th Amendment. You recall from our discussion of, of the Caroline Products footnote that in that footnote, uh, Justice Harlan, Chief Justice Harlan Fisk Stone um, launched the whole era of preferred freedoms. And the preferred freedoms were not just uh, the First Amendment. It was also uh, the the Fourteenth Amendment, because the Fourteenth Amendment guaranteed uh, a quality of treatment for minorities, and in particular uh, Afri African Americans and former slaves. So, um, so they defended on that point by saying, no. Even if you decide for us in this case. Uh, the next case could not involve somebody saying, I don't want to sell a cake to uh, an interracial couple or in any way, shape, or form discriminating on the basis of race. But they did say that <laughs> the same uh, principle that they were advocating of this baker being able to turn away these, um, uh, this, this same sex couple on the basis of religious principles could and would apply with respect to religion, with respect to national origin, with respect to age, with respect to sexual orientation, with respect to anything but race. Well, I think that that's very, very disturbing. I would hope it would be very, very disturbing to many of the justices, including some of the conservative justices. And I think it would be disturbing. It might be disturbing to the Chief Justice. So 
Again, if I had to bet my last 10 bucks, it's going to be a 5-4 to four decision with uh, Justice Kennedy being the deciding vote. Uh, and, I, and again, I'm not going to hazard a guess because he spent half his time attacking one side on free speech and half his time attacking the other side uh, on the basis of free exercise. So I think it would be five to four with Kennedy deciding. However, since I don't have to bet my last 10 bucks, I'm gonna go out on the limb and say, it's either five to four or six to three with Roberts on the side of the same-sex couple and on the side of Colorado and that will be either because he sees the really disturbing implications for public accommodations law and civil rights law in a contrary decision or because he simply wants to punt because the facts in this particular case are so bad because of the change in the law in Colorado between 2012 and the present time that he doesn't want the court to make a really, really major decision on a sort of a, uh, a bad set of facts and, and defers a decision until there are a clean set of facts. So it would, be, it would have been a clean set of facts and, and masterpiece if at the time that the guys came in and asked for their special cake that they uh, were married in Colorado had been married in Colorado or could have gotten married in Colorado. That would be a clean set of facts. And that would be the right kind of case to make a very, very, very major decision as this would be. Anyway, that's Masterpiece Cake Shop. Um, that's the end of this lecture. Uh, I will see uh, many of you tomorrow for the SCOTUS simulation and the argument, not tomorrow, well, um, this is Monday, so I will see you on Wednesday for that, for the argument of Snyder versus Phelps. And I will see you all on December 20th for your final examination. And uh, 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 I look forward to seeing you guys. That's it.